Hello ladies and gentlemen and welcome back to your Friday ramblings here on Roulette Productions and we are here once again to discuss all things pop culture awesome. As we teased last week today's episode is going to be discussing Shark Week and why are we discussing Shark Week? Because Shark Week is going on right now assuming you watch this episode the day it posts you're watching it archive style, eh, that's why we're doing this episode. So, what's so special about Shark Week? Well, it is special on a few different levels. And we're going to get into that, including some very personal reasons why it's special. So, let's get into the nitty gritty hard data first. Shark Week is an annual week-long TV programming block created by Tom Golden at the Discovery Channel, which features shark-based programming. Shark Week originally premiered on July 17, 1988, and is featured annually in July or early August every year since, and was originally conceived as a programming block devoted to promoting conservation efforts and correcting misconceptions about sharks. It has become one of the iconic programs on the Discovery Channel and since 2010 it has been the longest running cable television programming event in history. It is broadcast in over 72 countries and past episodes are available for purchase on services like Google Play YouTube, Amazon Video, and iTunes. Some episodes are free on the subscription-based Hulu service. So, that's the basics of it. Specifically, the nitty-gritty format is that every week, or every day during the Shark Week, Discovery Channel will premiere multiple hour-long, sometimes two-hour, depending on the nature of the programming, educational specials based around sharks. Last several years, it has been three a night, maybe, maybe differing the number up on the final night, as well as during the day marathoning specials that aired originally on previous years Shark Weeks and the last few years in particular have also featured a Shark Week After Dark special in which a host will interview people who figured into that night's particular programming getting extra information about them and you know, what it was like to make the special, why they are involved in shark research. Basically a late night talk show format. This year it is being done by Josh Gates as part of his Expedition Unknown show. We are very big fans of Josh Gates here at Roulette Productions. We will no doubt have a episode on him and his multiple TV shows he has had over the years in the future. More power to you, Josh. Now, things aren't always easy peasy, lemon squeezy. Unfortunately, sometimes there have been fumbles and foils with Shark Week. Let's go ahead and get those out of the way right quick. Now, over the many years that Shark Week has gone on and as it has become much more important to Discovery Channel's ratings, Shark Week basically serving as a special rating sweep season, at least for that one week. Discovery Channel has tweaked around with things trying to draw in people that 
typically would not watch educational programming about sharks. Unfortunately, this led to some executives greenlighting some docufiction. Docufiction is fictional programming done for the sake of entertainment presented as if it was, in fact, a documentary. These occurred in the 2010s. So, within the past decade of Shark Week, it did take quite a while for this kind of infiltration to occur. And was most infamously known with Megalodon, The Monster Shark Lives, and one year later with its sequel, Megalodon, The New Evidence, although a few other shows, such as Shark of Darkness, Wrath of Submarine, and Monster Hammerhead, were also docufictions. On the surface, the strategy was successful as Megalodon, The Monster Shark Lives, became one of the most watched programs in Shark Week history. Unfortunately, the airing of this program during the Shark Week block, which for those who are very much supportive of educational programming, along with Shark Week fans who saw it as what its intent was, which is this is the best of the best when it comes to shark educational programming, saw these docufictions over a period of a few years there as a infection and a mockery of Shark Week and what the aforementioned Mr. Golden originally planned it to be. As such, Discovery Channel got a lot of bad PR over the moves. And after a few years of this, Discovery Channel decided to go ahead and call a end to such things with Discovery President Rich Ross vowing to remove the type programming from the future Shark Week lineups. Unfortunately, only a couple years later, in 2017, Discovery Channel once again had criticism leveled at them when the network heavily promoted a race between Olympic gold winner Michael Phelps and a great white shark that turned out to be a simulation using a computer-generated shark. The idea being, hey, we're going to use a bunch of data on the fastest we have ever had confirmed sharks swimming and how that would compare to the fastest human beings can swim. So, again, a few people at Discovery Channel have made some missteps with Shark Week, but it is primarily still the place to be for such excellent programming. Now, after a while, Shark Week also came up with the idea of having a host for the week-long events who would introduce the individual episodes and generally keep the hype up. The first occurrence of this was in 1994 when our old friend Peter Benchley decided to host Shark Week. Certainly a great first a host to put on there, a man greatly associated with sharks who himself had, since writing Jaws and seeing the fear and paranoia towards shark that his novel had caused, has openly expressed a desire to correct the misconceptions about how evil and villainous sharks are. However, we would not see another host until 2000 when Nigel Marvin, who is a British wildlife TV presenter, television producer, author, and bird watcher, would host it for three years in a row. We took a break for 2003, then the cast of American Chopper showed up in 2004 in a bit of cross-promotion. This would continue for the next few years as Mythbusters Adam Savage and Jamie Heineman would tackle 2005, Mike Rowe from Dirty Jobs in 2006, 
and Les Stroud from Survivor Man in 2007. Mike Rowe and the Mythbusters would co-host in 2008. Les Stroud would come back in 2009, leading to the era of finding entertainers who are themselves fans of Shark Week, including the excellent comic Craig Ferguson in 2010, Andy Samberg in 2011, Philip DeFranco in 2012, and for those who do not know Philip James DeFranco, he is an American news commentator and YouTube personality, best known for the Philip DeFranco show. Josh Wolf in 2013 and 14, horror director and producer Eli Roth in 2015, 16, and 17. And in 2018, we got Shaquille O'Neal, followed by Rob Riggle in 2019, and as I said before in 2020, Josh Gates. Now, I will say personally, Eli Roth made an excellent host. Um, Shaquille O'Neal did a good job. He is an incredibly charismatic man who clearly was enjoying getting the chance to be associated with Shark Week. He is actually featured in a couple Shark Week specials as well as being a host. Uh, the Mythbusters did a great job when they hosted it, including those years being some special episodes of Mythbusters as part of the Shark Week programming. Not all the hosts have necessarily done as good as others. Personally, I thought Rob Riggle was a little weak. He leaned a little too heavily in his stand-up comedy roots. And not and kind of overshadowed what was going on, trying to. And, and again, I'm not saying I'm speaking necessarily for him exactly. I have not read his mind. But as a longtime viewer, I felt like Rob Riggle was using Shark Week to promote himself and get himself over, as opposed to him trying to get Shark Week over with people that are fans of his, but had maybe never watched Shark Week itself. Uh, Craig Ferguson, as a, another actor and comedian, did a better job, mostly because his comedy sense leans more towards the, you know, proper British, subtle self-depreciating thing, you know, the, oh, um, I'm sorry, I can't do his voice properly, I'm not even going to attempt it right now, but Craig Ferguson did a good job as a comedian, um, personally, I'm always going to lean towards people who are familiar with educational and documentary style programming being hosts, or people who themselves are associated with uh, marine conservation efforts. Because, again, kind of going back to what I had criticized Rob Riggle for, I feel like they are more prone to understanding who the star should be. And again, I'm not criticizing Rob Riggle's talents as a comedian or an actor. Um, and certainly Discovery Channel and its producers have to take some of that criticism as well because, you know, they were the ones who chose him and were giving Rob Riggle his direction. So they have to take a large amount of that flack too, but that's okay because you can't run a programming for, you know, 32 years and not make a few mistakes. Not make a few missteps. Especially when you're dealing with an audience that great. Everything I have said about the varying hosts and their skill levels is, of course, purely opinion. It is my opinion, therefore you are more than happy to disagree with me. In fact, I encourage you to not only disagree with me, but in a politeful and constructively critical manner, go ahead and let us know. 
because that's what it's all about, folks, here at Roulette Productions and the Friday Rambling. So, what about the actual programming? Well, Shark Week has stumbled into a few mini franchises because of things they do a documentary on that continue to provide great research year after year. And within the last 10 years or so, the Air Jaws series has been a yearly feature as they add more chapters to the documentary that focuses on Great White's breaching. Now this is of course something I'm sure you have seen clips of, especially if you are familiar with Shark Week, and that is when a shark, Great White, comes up, doesn't just break the surface of the water, I mean we've all seen a little mouth sticking out, hey how you doing, but its entire body breaks the water, usually ends up doing at least a half flip in air before crashing down into the water with all that massive weight. It is an incredible sight. And I always look forward to another Air Jaws chapter every year, not just because of how incredible the visuals are of seeing such a large creature just explode out of the water and its body twist and contort in air as it's, you know, attacking its prey and then that landing and the water shoots up everywhere, but specifically how these scientists that have specialized in this breaching research continue to find more hard data about it. Because it has been noted over the years on the Air Jaws specials that not every great white in every part of the world uses this form of attack, let alone as a regular weapon in its predatory arsenal. Very important to note. Now there have been various DVDs released over the years some of which are individual episodes, such as Bull Shark, World's Deadliest Shark, or Jaws of the Pacific. Others have been compilations, such as the Shark Week 20th Anniversary Collection, the Great Bites Collection, the Jaws of Steel Collection, and sometimes they've just flat out released the entire years worth of content. This is something very important. Now, go ahead and make sure I know what I'm looking for. Sorry about that. Had to had to double check my notes, make sure I had some stuff highlighted that I wanted to discuss. Now we have said that Discovery Channel has done docu fiction, and they got a lot of flack for that. However, they have kind of met people halfway by producing stuff that is very much real, very much educational, but does feature reenactment footage. The reason why is because these are about specific historical events. In fact, 
two of the most historically significant events in shark-human interaction have naturally been covered by Discovery Channel's Shark Week. Because how can you be the preeminent programming block for shark knowledge without discussing the two times where shark-human interaction has flat out embedded itself in history on a level where its ripple effects continue to this day. Ooh. Specifically, because now I see now you're in suspense. Now those of you who are not super shark obsessed like I am are going, what could he be talking about? What could be so interesting? What could what could have made that kind of impact? Two events, my friends. In 2009, Discovery Channel premiered Blood in the Water, which was based on the True Life series of shark attacks, also known as the 1916 Jersey Shore attacks. That became the inspiration for Peter Benchley's novel Jaws, which in turn inspired a movie, which in turn has inspired about a million Shark Attack films. It all goes back to the Jersey Shore attacks of 1916. And as I said, Blood in the Water tells a story via recreation TV movie style. So there is some entertainment suspense factor like you're watching a movie but there is a lot of education built into it as well for those of you who do not know about the jersey shore shark attacks of 1916 the short version because it is the kind of thing you can talk about for multiple hours at a time if you really want to dig deep into it discussed how on the J greater New Jersey Shore area during the summer of 1916 five people were attacked over the course of 12 days the Jersey Shore attacks triggered a nationwide panic as it was the first time that, that newspapers had speculated on the idea that a shark had become a man-eater and was specifically seeking out humans to eat as opposed to a one-off attack in a given area in a given year now seriously, five attacks in 12 days is intense. That's almost an attack every other day. I say almost because, again, uh, I'm not going to get super nitty-gritty details, but a couple of the attacks did occur on the same day. So it wasn't like an exact mathematically timed, perfectly synced thing. But still, five attacks in 12 days has never occurred before and never occurred since it is surreal. And I gotta say, it was very well done. It was a nice mix of the real-life suspense and drama, really making you empathize with the people who were living in that area at the time, not understanding what was going on, but knowing that something bad was happening to people. With a mixture of scientific facts... The basics being that over the years, while the initial thought was great white due to the severity of the attacks and its infamy as a shark dangerous to humans, because some of the attacks did occur in fresh water, slight, you know, as the shark apparently went upriver a little bit, proving eh, it's not always as easy as staying out of the salt water. A bull shark is also a very strong contender. These are the top two suspects, and scholars continue to this day debating which one is most likely the man-eater, or if it was even one shark, as opposed to multiple sharks who are all hunting in the same area and simply overlapping, which 
is also a possibility that is hotly debated. Now, this was a two hour special, which is rare for Shark Week, but with it being what it is, it certainly deserved the extra time. We also had in 2007, Ocean of Fear, Worst Shark Attack Ever, which was a made-for-television documentary film launched on the 20th anniversary of the Discovery Channel Shark Week. It recounts the sinking of the USS Indianapolis. Now, we did give a basic summary of the USS Indianapolis in our episode on the Jaws films because of how it factored into Quint's past and his present as a shark hunter. The short version of it, once again, is that the USS Indianapolis, again, let me make sure I'm quoting here right so I do not disrespect our lovely military. The USS Indianapolis was a Portland-class heavy cruiser of the United States Navy. And was in the process of completing a top-secret high-speed trip to deliver parts of Little Boy, the first nuclear weapon ever used in combat, to the United States Army Air Force Base on the island of Tinian. And on 015, on July 30th, the ship was torpedoed by the Imperial Japanese Navy submarine I-58 and sank in 12 minutes. Of 1,195 crewmen aboard, approximately 300 went down with the ship. The remaining 890 faced exposure, dehydration, saltwater poisoning, and shark attacks while stranded in the open ocean with few lifeboats and almost no food or, or water. They were out on the ocean for four days, and only 316 of the 890 that went into the water survived. Sinking of the Indianapolis resulted in the greatest single loss of life at sea from a single ship in the history of the U.S. Navy. Now, again, we can go a lot deeper into that, but that's a different show for a different time. Now, the Ocean of Fear a uh, documentary film shows both recreations of what it was like for those men out on the water for four days based on research by George H. Burgess a renowned investigator in shark attacks to determine why the sharks attacked the way they did and to investigate the survival strategies of the men in the water including those who fought the sharks so that we can get a better ratio of finding out how many of the men who did not survive were directly attacked by the sharks and who died due to their injuries from the, the injuries that occurred during the sinking of the Indianapolis exposure dehydration, and the saltwater poisoning, which we all mentioned a moment ago. Um, for those of you who do not spend a lot of time out in nature, one of the bad things about the water is that the sun tends to reflect off water. And therefore, if you are floating out in the middle of water, it is a lot easier to both get sunburned and suffer things like heat stroke. And heat stroke can kill you. It is not a joke at all. Saltwater poisoning pretty much speaks for itself. Your body is not physically capable of drinking salt water. Do not do it. And of course, dehydration, starvation, again, speak for themselves. Your body needs food, food and fresh, non-salt water to survive. You can only go so much time without them. Especially if you are 
again, suffering from exposure to the elements and potential bodily injury from being on a sinking ship when it, due to it being torpedoed. Now, it was in a very excellently done special. I myself have seen it. And I think, honestly, for something where we have so few people left alive and those that to provide direct eyewitness testimony on what happened and those who did are certainly suffering from the trauma of it all as... I, I mean, seriously. Less than half the people that went in the water survived. And that's on top of the people that died in the immediate attack on the ship. It's... It, it, it's... I, I can't imagine. Like, all respect in the world to the survivors of the USS Indianapolis and... What they have, what they lived with for the rest of their lives. Um, uh, many of them are no longer with us due to the fact that it was many decades ago. Time always wins out in the end. Uh, any of them who did give testimony at any point in their lives, we are certainly very uh, fortunate for that. And much respect for them reliving what they had to go through out there on the water. Uh, the basics of the attacks is that... I mean, honestly, in the special touches on this... In the initial first years after the Indianapolis, they wanted to blame pretty much everybody that survived the initial sinking but did not survive until rescue on the shark attacks. The number is now been adjusted. I don't have the exact figures for you, um, so I don't want to quote exact numbers and being correct, but the basis of it is that a lot of men, their bodies were not recovered, and while they may have been eaten by the sharks, they were not necessarily alive when the sharks attacked. There was scavenging of corpses going on, on top of attacking of living sailors. It is certainly something that, to this day, um, scientists, especially those specializing in shark behavior, continue to be puzzled over. Um, yes, it was a lot of, you know, from the shark's perspective, easy food, but the continuous nature of the attacks was again I mean we, we've had other ships sinking that part of the world and we didn't see behavior like this from the sharks it's it's just a crazy thing as I said we're going to have to talk about that on another episode because it, it will fill up a lot of time Now, besides that, there have been a few other um, true stories that as single events have served for inspiration for Shark Week programming. And we will continue to get them, no doubt, through the years. So, this leaves a big question. As somebody who has been obsessed with sharks since, I mean, I was a little kid. I mean, I remember being in elementary school and getting books from the library about sharks. It's not because I had an encounter with them at the beach or anything. It's just I've always been, I've always found myself drawn to fish and sharks are, I mean, really all ocean life, but the sharks more than anything else. I have watched... I don't think I saw it the first couple of years, but I have watched damn near every year of Shark Week in the, as I said, we're now on year 32, 33, 88, 
Uh, we are on the 33rd year now, and I am watching the programming. It is, by and large, most excellent. We have an interesting special with Iron Mike Tyson. I'm not going to go into too much detail on that because we do try to have a generally spoiler-free policy here, especially since, as I said, Discovery Channel will re-air the new specials during the day, during the week, and whatnot. So I don't want to say too much about any given episode this year because I want to encourage you to watch it. Watch Mike Tyson play with sharks. That's all I'm going to tell you. In short, Shark Week has been part of my life for, you know, 90% of my life. And as long as Discovery Channel keeps putting it on, I'm going to keep watching. And for those of you who don't watch it, give it a try. You know? Last few years, I've been DVRing it, mostly because I tend to work at nights. So, you know what? Don't be afraid of having to sit through a bunch of commercials. Yep. Technically, you don't, you know, if you do DVR stuff, you don't need the full hour. Without the commercials, it's closer to like 40 minutes. 45 minutes, maybe. That doesn't sound like that much time. You know? Watch it with your family. It's educational. It'll be good for the children. They're really, really, really small. Maybe not the Air Jaws stuff. Maybe not the I Survive Shark Attack stuff. That might scare them a little. But there's been an ongoing series the last few years on alien sharks. No, not literally like UFOs. But the sharks that live like so super deep down in the water. Like way down, way down in the water. That... I mean, they look like something out of a horror film. And because it's so hard to get down there and so hard to study them, we know almost nothing about them. Which is why I like it when every year I see a new entry in the Alien Shark series show up. Because, dude, I might see a shark I've never seen before. That's exciting. Like that is, I'm I'm not like I'm not even patronizing or anything at this point. The idea of seeing a shark that I've never seen on video before that excites me as a viewer. I can't imagine what it's like for the scientists actually, you know, analyzing data, researching it, potentially holding the sharks. You know, I mean it's it's. It's everything I love about science. I love me some science. So, Shark Week is a wonderful thing. It is one of the great TV traditions. Alright? You should be watching Shark Week. This episode airs Friday mornings. That means you have Friday night and Saturday night left of this year's Shark Week. You can at least catch part of it if you haven't been watching it this year. You will most likely have it next year as well. I certainly hope so. There is a Shark Week 2021. Watch the whole thing. Watch it with your family. Watch it with your friends. See Air Jaws. See alien sharks. See the celebrities interact with sharks. It can be kind of funny seeing the big bad, you know, professional athletes. You know, Bill, Bill, Bray, Bill, Bill, strong man. Getting freaked out by a shark. That's good times. That's schadenfreude. So, that's going to wrap us up for this week. We're going to see you in seven days for another rambling. It will not be shark related. I've 
I think I've pretty much run out, run out the patience on everybody when it comes to shark-related content, at least on Friday Ramblings, for a while. For now, I am going to say, you're going to have to tune in next week because I'm not giving teasers this time. We're going to start something brand new. And you're going to have to watch to see what it is. You can catch me on Twitter, at David Horridan. You can comment on the YouTube videos right here that you're watching right now. Feel free to make suggestions for future topics. But remember, first rule of roulette productions is we criticize respectfully and constructively. Because this is a little glimmer of positivity and hope to make your weekend start off right. So don't bring the hate. You don't have to bring blind love, but don't bring the hate. There is a middle ground. Here's the love, here's the hate, here's the part in the middle. That's where we like to reside. See you next Friday, folks.